Hello, this is Michaela Stocks with Indiana Housing and Community Development Authority. I'm the Housing Inventory Chart and Point in Time Analyst. And this is a podcast session with Forrest Gilmore, Executive Director of Shalom Community Center. And we're here to talk about the point in time count and best methodologies and how to recruit volunteers, what, um, what the experience is like. And so here we go. All right, thank you for joining me, Forrest. Yeah, it's good to be talking to you. <laughs> great, great, thank you. And so the first question I have for you is, what was your first experiencing coordinating a point in time like? I, I don't I don't I'm not sure I remember my first time I've been doing it for a, a long a long time I've uh, attempted to pass it off <laughs> a couple <laughs> times and did that successfully once or twice and then um, but uh, but it, it's something now that I feel like I've been around for a long time and I feel committed to getting it done well so I've been doing it for a long time and just I feel like just you know, this is my niche now to just kind of do this at least for a while and, and uh, bring in some you know, maybe some co-leadership over time, but, uh, but, but the, the experience helps getting it done every year after year. But, uh, you know, it, it went well the first, you know, every year we learn something new and, or learn something again that we forgot or, <laughs> <laughs> so there's always, uh, you know, new things that are going on. And, and, um, you know, I do remember the first time encountering the, the pit count when, when I just started working in, at Shalom. And uh, uh, it was just a few days after I started, and people, uh, that was our uh, first and last year where we did a, uh, well, the first year from my experience, but last year that we did a actual, like, on the street count where we went out and um, tried to find people at night. Um, and so it was really fascinating to see this gathering of people all together kind of going out to do that. And we, we haven't done that uh, since because we haven't found it particularly effective to catch people that we don't catch in other ways, but um, or count in other ways. But um, but that was kind of fascinating, just seeing that happen and, and people getting all ready and geared up to go out and and, and find people. Wow! Yeah, that's that's awesome. Uh, so, would you say that's something that you had wish you had known back then was that maybe just going out. And exploring at night's probably not the best way to capture unsheltered populations. Or, well, I, I mean, it's. I think that's for our community. So oh, okay. you know, everybody, every community is different. Um, our community's, um, you know, uh, smaller than some. We're certainly not Indianapolis, where a street count like that might be more valuable. Mm -hmm. But we have a good sense of where people stay and and uh, where people go, and we have uh, good day shelter resources too. So, uh, in our community, so we tend to. Um, uh, have a good sense, a good street outreach, so we have we have a good sense of where people are, so that we can make sure that we we're able to to count them. Oh, that's great! As best as possible. Okay. Yeah. Is there anything that you wish you had known back in your first point in time methodology strategies? <laughs> oh, um, I mean, I think I think the biggest thing is is that it comes fast. You know, the count comes really quickly. And so um, it's good to get ahead of, ahead of time and, and to really kind of get going. The holidays kind of, you know, just get stuck right in the middle there. And so, <laughs> and so they can impact a lot of your volunteer recruitment and things like that. So, um, so it's good to get started early and to communicate early and bring people on board as quickly as you can. Uh, all that really makes a big difference. And I think it's also really important to kind of, you know, remember what went well and what didn't work in one year and kind of take note of that and then pass those notes on to the next year so that you have a you know a building um, learning base over time so um, so those are some things too. just kind of pay attention to what works and what doesn't work and keep holding on to those things yeah uh, and building you know so so you learn more it's a great answer it's almost like I planted you to say that but I didn't <laughs> That's great. Thank you. Um, what is, in your opinion, the best methodology for the point in time count other than, you know, starting early, communicating? Yeah, no, I, I'm not sure I, I know what's best. I know what's been working for us is That's that great. we have, you know, we have three parts in the count, right? So there's the count where where um, that's uh, the portion of the count that's people are counted who are in shelters that use HMIS. Mm -hmm. And so, um, so part of the count is reminding those shelters and keeping up on them and making sure that they're 
um, they're up to date on that day and to be really clear that you've got to make sure that your HMIS setup is all your exits are done and all your entries are done and that and that that count reflects uh, uh, perfectly your your client uh, list for that day your guest list for that day um, so that's one one thing and then we do um, shelter counts that are non HMIS and that's so then that's the other portion is the survey counts right so um, where we do the paper surveys with people and so we target two areas we target um, um, shelters that are non HMIS and um, just really work with them in advance get them on board make sure that we have good volunteers in there that know, know, knows what's going on and really make sure that all of those are covered um, and that every every single one has has volunteers in them that will be doing the count on the on the night of the count and then we uh, choose, um, we've chosen um, kind of survey locations around um, our community that we know that people are, uh, that often frequent that are not overnight shelters. So uh, Shalom is a day center and so, so that's one place where we count a lot of people. Mm -hmm. We also have people go to the park and the libraries and we have our street outreach teams go out throughout the day to the locations, to the camps that they know, that are aware of to make sure that they um, uh, capture people. So those are probably our three, you know, kind of uh, groups that we target uh, and areas that we target to make sure that we get as many people as we can. Great. Yeah. Wow, that's great. Uh, so what has been the role of IHCDA in the point in time count and how should a service provider best utilize IHCDA? You know, before I answer that question, I just realized there's one other thing that, oh, <laughs> that, yeah, that I think is really important and powerful is that um, is that getting people to participate in the surveys can be sometimes really challenging. Mm -hmm. And so we really use incentives to make sure that that, uh, that that is motivating for people to participate, that they get a reward or a gift, you yeah. know, for participating. And so we, you know, buy a lot of basic um, kind of bus tickets or housing or hygiene products or or you know um, things that people might really want that um, are enticing. You know, it could be like um, uh, toothbrush and toothpaste, or it could be um, uh, like deodorants really popular. Um, socks are really popular. Um, we found like even like that gold bond foot powder is really popular. Like things oh. that, that I wouldn't have immediately thought of are really popular. That that um, gets people um, really interested. Um, so those are just some of the things that really help help more people participate in the survey, um, uh, which is a real value. And just to note, you're not allowed to advertise in advance <laughs> that you have incentives for people to come out for the count. Yeah. So, so uh, just make sure you don't do that. But, um, but, uh, but those incentives really help people participate on the day of when you're trying to um, motivate people to participate and take their time to really do something that that um, only in a very distant sense serves them so so that's helpful that's wonderful yeah so well, <laughs> remind me again of what the quick oh question, yeah of course <laughs> uh, what role has IHCDA taken in helping with uh, your point in time count and how should a service provider best utilize IHCDA uh, sure. So, I mean, IHCDA obviously at, at designs the process, um, particularly designs the survey. So the paper survey is the core uh, element of the count. Mm -hmm. So um, so working with IHCDA to do that, IHCDA usually does a training every year of coordinators mm -hmm. and also does a training of volunteers. Mm -hmm. And that's um, one of the, the big challenges is, um, is making sure to have your volunteers recruited in time so they can actually participate in that training in a timely way. So, um, so and again, that's where the holidays kind of get in the way and kind of mess up things. So that's something to be aware of real early is to is to start recruiting your volunteers as soon as you can, so that when the announcement about the volunteer training comes out, you can you can do that um, uh, and and let people know about it so they have time to plan and prepare so they can take that training. Yeah, that's great. That's a perfect time for me to plug. Join mm -hmm. in IHCDA's volunteer training, January 9th and 11th. Oh, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> the data is already designed there. <laughs> so, more information on that uh, coming up. <laughs> 
Um, how do you typically recruit volunteers? Who have you found to be the most willing to volunteer? So we, we uh, primarily recruit uh, through our um, uh, through our regional council. So we're region 10 and um, our regional council, um, uh, is, we call the, the uh, South Central Housing Network, um, is, uh, is the is the starting point where we do much of our recruitment so that's all that's a lot of the service providers in our community mm -hmm. and um so uh they're often motivated we talk to all the different shelters too and see if they have people within their uh, shelters that want to volunteer um we find that interns um we're, we're, we are, we're connected with iu and so we have a lot of relationships with interns especially social work interns and mm -hmm. they they um are often uh, motivated to participate they think this is a really cool thing and like wow a nice experience you know that they can get and gain so um, that's really good and and uh, this year we're gonna see how this goes but um, we're um, just uh, in the in conversations about talking with a, a new SPIA professor hmm. who uh, who out of Indianapolis was regularly doing the pit count with her classes up there Oh, wow. And might participate with us down uh, down here, at least getting involved. So we may get some students involved that way. That's amazing. So, so yeah, we'll see how that goes. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, so um, those kinds of partnerships really help. Uh, and having IU here obviously really helps um, when we can connect to, the, to them and build those relationships. That's wonderful. Great. Yeah. Uh, so what have you seen as a common mistake in previous point in time counts? Yeah. Um, I, th I think again going back to the paper count um, that's the biggest place where we um, can see errors on the actual paper surveys themselves and so filling out the actual uh, survey is often um, uh, challenging uh, for people in some ways because they don't have a precision uh, of in, in knowledge about some of the answers mm -hmm. so um, one of the biggest areas we see is in the the um, where do you sleep uh, last night question um, yeah. and um, people not necessarily knowing what is transitional housing in our community or knowing what is emergency shelter in our community so they don't necessarily put those in the right places mm -hmm. um, we've also seen like um, uh, even just on the the opening tab of name county location all that because people do a lot of these mm -hmm. they uh, um, tend to not fill those out or, or not fill them out fully and because they're kind of processing and trying to move fast um, especially in you know in, in when they're doing counts in a non HMIS shelter when they mm -hmm. can be trying to process a lot of surveys all at once um, those those can uh, sometimes people make mistakes on those and um, you know give incorrect answers in that, in that area and that can be you know that can lead to bad data, which yeah. we don't want. We don't want bad data. No. no we want to, I mean, especially people putting effort into participating in a survey, we want to make sure that that's the case. One of the challenges, too, we see is that sometimes people who are, um, who are not homeless um, will participate in a survey. Um, oh. And, you know, because they don't, they don't understand the definitions of what literal homelessness is and what it isn't. And, um, they hear about the incentives and so they're motivated to get some incentives so that's always a, a little bit of a challenge um, to navigate that and um, and um, you know I, I, we're generally we try to get more in rather than rather than undershoot we try to overshoot but that's something to sort through after you've done the surveys is to look through the ones that might uh, people might not fit the literal homeless cattle count um, status and then just kind of uh, pull those surveys out uh, before sending them in. Yeah. Yeah. That's Depending good. On what you want, but those are generally ineligible. Somebody's going to reject those. And mm -hmm. so um, it depends on what ICDA wants, I think. But in the past, I think they've asked us to pull those out. Or at least last year, I think they asked us to pull those out. So. Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yeah, yeah great. Uh, so how have typically... Um, those experiencing homelessness uh, ex responded to the questions asked during the point in time count. Yeah, so it's it's mixed. You know, people experience all kinds of different things. 
<clears throat> and the, when people do the count, some people do them real, real easy, and they're happy to participate, and and they're happy about getting the incentive. <clears throat> you know that, that those are really nice, like you know, bus tickets or or socks or whatever. <clears throat> um, and so, so they're just you know they're just happy to jump right in. Yeah. But there are definitely some people who are more protective. There are people who are fearful of computers. Mm -hmm. um, people are fearful of having their data online. Um, you know, and so that becomes trickier. Mm -hmm. And um, sometimes the incentives will help people over the the you know the hump, so to speak. Um, but honestly, there are people that will just that will will turn us down. You know, there's not a lot that generally turn us down, but they're are definitely people that um, we know are literally homeless that won't participate in the survey and there's unfortunately not much you can do about that that I'm mm -hmm. at least that I have figured out once you know once they decline if the incentives are not motivation enough to get them to participate then that's that's where it has to end sadly yeah, yeah. that's completely understandable yeah uh, so what would you say are the overall strengths and weaknesses of the point in time count I mean, the best thing about the point in time count is it gives us a um, representative number of how many people are experiencing homelessness on any given day in our community that we can look at over years. You know, we can look at, like, we have data in our community going back to 2007, so we have more than a decade of data, so we can kind of track the number of people experiencing homelessness in our community, how it's, how unfortunately in our community it's increased. Um, although we also have some sub data. So we can see how some subpopulations have decreased and some have stayed the same, some have increased. So, so there's real value in kind of looking at that over time. Mm -hmm. Our general, you know, the failure, I think, of the pit count is, is that it's always an undercount. <laughs> and, <clears throat> and we have to take that, um, uh, we have to be honest about that and, and mm -hmm. know that this number will, is, is an interesting representative sample of our community and and it, it will definitely be short um, and and so it's important when when talking about these numbers with the community realize that you know that um, that that it is an undercount and that it represents some of whom we see on any given day but it doesn't represent all <clears throat> and that's um, tricky because people like to get attached to a number and be like that's what the number is mm -hmm. and um, and Unfortunately, uh, this number is useful, but it's, and honestly, it's the best, I think the best number we have for looking at homelessness in a community. It's the most comprehensive um, opportunity to collect this data and look at this data and use this data, but still it falls short of, of perfection for a number of reasons. People that we miss, people that won't participate. Yeah. Um, and uh, so, yeah, so, so it's good information. Um, but not perfect information. So. Yeah, that's great. Uh, any other comments that you have on the point in time count? Um, I, I guess I'll just co come back to that. Is is that uh, it is yeah, from my mind the single most important indicator of uh, the state of homelessness in our community, mm -hmm. and so <laughs> it's the one time uh, each year where we pull all our resources together. To try and uh, count every single person experiencing literal HUD-defined homelessness in our community, and that is a very useful and unique um, uh, number and uh, and really important data. So, so that's what uh, that's why I really value the pit count is is that the data is just um, super valuable, and so um, so we should uh, make a real effort to make it as strong as possible. Yeah, I agree. That's wonderful. Well, that's all that I have. And thank you so much for answering all the questions and providing really great advice. Um, thank you for joining me. <laughs> thank you.